Welcome everybody to another episode of ZB's Horsepower Talk. As always, I'm ZB, Zach Brown. Got an awesome episode for you today. We have the general manager of South Boston Speedway, Chase Brashears, coming on the program. Now, South Boston Speedway is one of the NASCAR route tracks and such historic racetrack, 66 years running. Chase will dive into that. We'll talk to him about that a little bit. Before we welcome him in, big shout out to Big Frig Cooler sending me these tumblers. Keep your drinks cold, hot, do whatever you need them to do. Really uh, appreciate them uh, for the uh, the support. And I love keep my drinks cold and hot. So go check them out at bigfrig.com. Let's welcome in the general manager for South Boston Speedway, Chase Brashear. Chase, I appreciate you hopping on uh, with us today. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, just uh, tell us a little bit about your job. I see you're the general manager up there. So uh, what kind of is the day, uh, day-to-day day operations of general manager at a speedway? That's the title on paper for sure. Um, it's, a, it's a lot of stuff on the day-to-day. We're in a two-week break right now, so it's a good job right now. It's just kind of catching up on some paperwork and stuff. Um, so, uh, But it, it, at a short track, we're a pretty small staff. You know, We only have a, a few folks there on uh non-race days i think there's it depends sometimes there's two sometimes there's four of us in the office just depending on what's going on there's usually uh two guys outside operations uh wise and maintenance so pretty small staff day to day so um so a lot of days are full of the fun stuff like accounting and just random paperwork and such and then some days are event schedules or, or th- more fun things like that and then race days actually the the fun day you know but um uh, I have a good team here, and uh, we all kind of we all kind of do a little bit of everything. So if walls need painted and we're behind because of rain, you know, whoever's available, go grab a paintbrush and help out the operations guys. So, how long have you been in that position at the speedway? Um, this is my, I guess, second year technically as the official GM. I came here in 2021 as Kathy Rice was retiring and she, as she transitioned out, I transitioned in. So I guess on paper, two years um, or two and a little bit, two and three quarter, two and a half, whatever you want to say. Well, that's awesome. Uh, have you been with the Speedway or you said you came from the outside and, uh, and joined from a different track before? I came from NASCAR uh, this last time. I worked at some short tracks and even raced some during college. Uh, in Tennessee and Virginia, but uh, this last time I came from from NASCAR um, up to work for Pocono here at their South Boston property. Okay, awesome. Uh, what uh, what did you do for NASCAR specifically before this? Um, two years I worked in the weekly and touring racing operations, we called it. So it was a lot of managing the racetrack relationships for the touring series, um, ARCA East and West, the Modified and the NASCAR Pinty Series in Canada. I worked with those as well as what's uh, now the NASCAR Advanced Auto Parts Weekly Series, some of those guys as well. Um, so did, it was, like I said, racing operations. So it was everything from marketing and things of that nature to helping out the series um, directors and officials on their events and race directing some. And then I did uh, two years as race director for some of the regional tours and then the Xfinity and Truck Series as well. Well, wow, been a pretty busy, uh, busy career so far for you. Then I would say in racing. Yeah, absolutely. It's been fun. That's uh, pretty much all I've, I've ever done. So. Um, so that, you grew up in the racing community, I would assume. Yeah, some. Uh, I didn't. You know, my family grew up going to races at Bristol, and I, I didn't get into racing until high school, as far as like start racing, um, and then I started working for the the venues. Um, and it kind of, like I said, did that through high school and college. And then right after college, got an opportunity to go to work for NASCAR, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then that, that kind of led he- back to a short track here. And then, um, so yeah, always been around racing or, or construction. My family owns a heavy equipment construction business in Kentucky. So those two have pretty much led the way. Well, um, 
such a the South Falls is such a historic track, and for a lot of people who don't know, I mean, it's is where the roots of NASCAR really are, and racing really. Um, if you can, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the the history of the track and what, at least, what you know and uh, and everything about that historic racetrack? For sure, it's definitely uh, a historic racetrack. We like to think of it as one of the best short tracks in the country. Maybe that's an arrogant statement, but um, that's kind of how we think of it and how we market it and everything. Um, so it's it's 66 years old. It was uh, last year was actually its 65th anniversary. So it opened in 1957. It was a little bitty dirt track here um, in Halifax, Virginia. And then a few years later, I'd have to look to get you the exact dates. Um, but uh, a few years later, they they paved it, and then uh, it continued to grow and grow. Eventually, it hosted um, the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series and the NASCAR what is now the Xfinity Series. Um, it also hosted the Cup Series at times, you know, back in its earlier days. And uh, just throughout the years, it, it turned into a 3 8 mile asphalt oval, and then it expanded to its current uh, 4 tenths mile oval. And it was last, um, wasn't reconfigured, but it was repaved and had some improvements done in 2017. But it's had that 4 tenths of a mile uh, configuration since the 90s, early 2000s, around there. Mm. So, uh Started out as uh, mainly a modified track, and then uh, in 83, it turned into a, a what then, or what NASCAR came out with as the late model stock car, which it still runs today as its feature division. So this year is actually 40 years of late model stock car racing. Oh, wow. And then, uh, so it's always been known for the late model stocks, but, uh, you know, it, it it always is kind of said that it, it was built for modifieds, and we had modifieds this past uh, the week before Easter. Um, and, if, and if anybody saw the event, they'll know why they say that the place was built for modifieds. Um, they just put on an awesome show here. But so that's kind of the, the brief history of the place. You know, it's owned by Pocono Raceway since 2004, uh, which is a really cool story. It's had a ton of different notable drivers. Um, the Burton family is from here, the Sadler family. So a ton of drivers um, have come through South Boston. Um, and a ton of them actually are from right here in South Boston as well. Since Pocono has taken over the ownership of it, has that, um, I guess, improved the the growth of the track uh, overall? It has. Um, we're The place is really fortunate that Pocono really reinvests um, so much back into it. You know, for, for them, it's it's not about a, a, a revenue stream. It's about giving back to the racing community, kind of like your, your major league teams give back to your minor league through minor league teams not not saying that it's minor league but i think that's the easiest thing to compare it to so it's really important to them to give back to short track racing back to the nascar roots and back to the community so they they reinvest a ton of it uh, each year you know the last big renovation in 2017 was a million dollar renovation wow. um and i mean every every year they're investing tons of money back into the facility um, to keep it up well, that's awesome. I mean, being such a historic track, it's you see so many things, such as uh, the Lost Speedways uh, show that Junior goes to, and all these tracks that were so historic. But whether it was economical or just the families pass away and just people aren't able to keep up with the track, those awesome tracks are now gone. So it's great to see that an old track just south, such as South Boston is still around. So uh, we. Uh, us fans definitely appreciate the uh, the history of that and appreciate everybody that's a part of it to uh, keep up with the track and keep it alive and everything. Absolutely. Uh, you have to have a love for this sport to do it. You know, nobody's getting rich off of weekly racing necessarily. Uh, and that goes for the racers and, and the teams too, right? They We all do this because we love it, um, not because we're looking to be millionaires off of weekly racing, but uh, like I said, it, it's a it's a way for them to get back to this community and and grassroots racing in general and to keep grassroots racing alive. Well, what um, what does the uh, the track do week in and week out, year after year, to continue to keep the crowds going? I mean, you got new generations coming up. There's new demographics coming into NASCAR track is always packed as always it's always bringing in people so uh what what have you seen i guess probably more of like a modernization of the racetrack for sure um we're really fortunate we have a strong weekly crowd for a uh, asphalt short track um so we're really fortunate you know 
we don't race every weekend, and I think that's what helps um, helps our crowd. It also allows folks to go to other venues and such. Um, we don't really like to step on anybody, so we, we try to put our schedule out, and we only do like the 13 or 14 weekly races a year. We do some other stuff outside of racing, but um, as far as weekly short track racing, it's 13 or 14 a year, and that allows folks to schedule around it. Um, but, you know, it also allows us to make every show a, a big event, so to speak, yeah. um, in some way or another. So the late model races are always either straight hundreds or twin 75s for the most part. And then uh, our crown jewel is the July 4th Thunder Road Harley Davidson 200 presented by Grand Atlantic Ocean Resort, which is the 200 lap late model stock race uh, the 4th of July weekend. Always a huge show. Um, so that that was the easy sell, right? That's the that's the granddaddy of them all but uh on a weekly basis we do a lot of um we've shifted to a lot of digital you know we we still reach out to those core fans of course but i think like everybody we're, we're all grabbing for that younger younger demographic um because they're they're your next generation you know so you have to prepare for that so we we've, we've took the place the last two and a half three years um really into a more modernized marketing um way so it's a lot of outreach on social and digital. It's a lot of just, um, you know, or, organic stuff on there. Um, we also, the place is now streaming on Flow Racing. So we're, we're a partner with them. And that that really helps get the place out, not only, you know, in this area, but countrywide and even worldwide, if you want to look at it that way. So those are kind of our, our tactics that we've been running with um, and just doing different things. Um, if, if you ever have you know had a conversation with me you'll probably notice that i bounce around a lot i have terrible adhd That's uh, perfect. and i uh, i hate doing the the same thing over and over i just i hate being repetitive so yes. you know even though we may have the same amount of races or whatever a year we we always try to find different things to do um like the this most recent event a couple of weeks back fell on april fool's weekend so the team here we did some goofy things with race distances and even pacing one of the races backwards saying we were going to run backwards and just goofy stuff. And, you know, I say goofy in a, in a good way, like just yeah. things to break up the monotony, different promotions um, and just all kinds of stuff like that. Well, I want to touch on this. Uh, you're actually the second uh, member of a speedway that I've talked to. I've talked to the store at Port Royal Speedway, the dirt track in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, couple years ago and it's been the topic of this entire nation and world for uh, these past couple of years not pe no, people want to forget about it but I at least want to touch on it 2020 uh, with from your perspective your uh, the speedways perspective I don't think you were there quite a year there yet but um, just in general the speedway operations from afar that you've seen how is how did COVID affect that and do you have you talked to anybody at South Boston of how the pandemic affected it yeah there, there's no doubt that it affected it um and like i mentioned earlier we're, we're blessed with that ownership of pocono that's passionate about the place and, and you know it's a family-owned group um honestly if, if it hadn't i wasn't here at the time i was transitioning in late in 2020 um 2021 we still had a lot of those restrictions that we had to work with them but 2020 the, the place actually didn't host an event at all um, it had some like track rentals for practices, but it, it never hosted a spectator event. Um, they tried several times and, you know, the restrict, excuse me, the restrictions would get loosened and then they would get clamped back down because of a, another outbreak or whatever. Um, so they ended up not running at all. And, and if it hadn't have been for that ownership, of Pocono, I, I, I don't know what um, South Boston would look like right now um, because of that. You know, I, there's so many great short tracks that, you know, they, they had to give up a ton to be able to survive and sustain through that. Um, so, and, and South Boston is no different. You know, it, it was tough to sit here and not have an event for the entire year. Like I said, uh, nobody does this for the money in short track racing. At least we don't. But at the same time, it does take some money to keep the lights on. And not having any events, certainly, that, that made for a tricky situation there. Right. Did that help pro um in a, in a way, did the pandemic oddly help out in the long runs to help prepare and get new ideas for things? Uh, because, like I said, with Port Royal, they were like, some part of it was a little bit of a blessing because we weren't quite ready for certain things at the beginning of that year. And we were able to 
uh, invested a lot more and up, do a lot of upgrades and things like that with the track. So was there anything with that that you may have seen or they have talked about? Yeah, I I don't know that um, I don't know that I would call it a blessing necessarily in that regard um, for the place. Obviously, I wasn't here, so I can't speak to a ton of stuff they did before. Right. Uh, I, I will say that probably the the catch twenty two in it was the pent up demand that it created. So I, I think it was honestly a part of the short track revitalization. You know, folks realized that the short tracks were important again uh, a little bit and i think you've seen that in the years since um you know our looking back at the historical data our crowds are better the last couple of years um than they were pre pre 2020 for the most part um you know we're not talking a ton like it, it was not at all worth not having to run in 2020 for it by any stretch of the imagination but that did come out of that um, and i think it also showed back to that the digital stuff it showed the short track racing world because they've always been a little slow to adapt um, in several areas and digital and streaming being one um, especially the asphalt community i think the dirt track world really had a leg up on us and and i think through 2020 and so many venues starting to research that it really pushed that um, towards the end of 2020 and into 2021 is how important digital and streaming and things like that are right um kind of going off of uh, new events and everything happening with the Speedway. Tony Stewart's SRX series um, made an appearance at the Speedway last season. Uh, Touch on that a little bit. How did that uh, come to fruition? And uh, how was this event different from your normal weekly racing? For sure. So obviously they were looking for prestigious short tracks to go to. Um, Coming into 2021, they were – um, you know, we were kind of a part of the conversation. We were still in some pretty tight restrictions here um, of COVID, like we mentioned. So it, it was tough to really commit to, I guess, is the best way to say that. Um, obviously, in 2022, we knew where we were. We were out of those restrictions. So um, we really um, pushed hard myself and Nick Ogdowski, the CEO uh, of here and Pocono Raceway. We really pushed hard there and worked with those guys at SRX. Um, it, it was a great event. It was different um, in a lot of ways, you know, um, than a weekly show just from operations wise. So seats were reserved, which is something that the place hadn't seen since probably the Xfinity Series days back in the early 2000s and such. Um, the crowd was we, we had a lot of the, the frequent flyers, I guess you could say, our regulars. Um, but overall, it was a lot of first time fans. I mean, And you can judge that by looking at the ticket sales, but also just the questions that you get from people. So uh, we spent a lot of time operationally uh, with signage and, you know, know before you go and stuff that generally we don't have to do, especially on a weekly basis. So that was a a huge new thing for that event. Um, And it was it was a ton of first time fans. I mean, um, I would I would say the majority of the crowd was probably a first time fan or a non frequent fan, as I would put it. But it was a lot of fun to watch. It's really cool to see uh, uh, Tony discuss with all the the other owners of SRX, hey, which tracks we want to go to. And it helps m- keep making names for these tracks and reminding people that these tracks are still out there. And I think for me especially, I'm, I'm like, I've heard, kind of heard of South Boston. I'm like, what, what exactly is this track? And then you sit, watch that race. I'm like, this is an awesome track. It's a lot of fun. And then you have the streaming service with flow and you're able to tune in. I'm like, this is really good racing and everything. So I think that definitely, at least from my opinion, outside looking in, that definitely propelled a lot of fans to to check out uh, the Speedway racing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the goal. And, and a lot of folks have asked um, if they're returning this year, obviously they're not, or if, if they know they're not, why are they not? And um, honestly, SRX isn't really designed for that. Stafford is kind of the outlier Um, especially now with um, being right in ESPN's back door, who is their TV partner now. But really, SRX isn't designed to go back repetitively. You know, you saw them go to Eldora, and then they took off, and then they're back at Eldora. And that's kind of the conversations we've had with them is, um, I I do think you'll see them return here, but it it will be, there's going to be a gap between. um, Just because it's a novelty, SRX is a novelty. You know, they only go to six tracks a year. Uh, And it's really important not to water down that novelty. And and we're really big on that. Same thing with 
we had sprint cars last year um, and we had some challenges with the event, um, but it was the first time ever for 410 sprints here and they were really fast. So challenges are expected, but um, it was a successful event, but they're not back this year. And they were never really intent. Even when we worked with that series to schedule that event, it's like, okay, you know, let's look at two years down the road from now and plan that day again. And, and that's kind of how we operate. We don't like to water down things. Well, it makes it more special for everybody too. And, yes. and it, that's exactly, it just makes it more special. And that, and also your weekly racing, you don't race every single uh, week with everything. And that's also makes it special, make, gets the crowds to come out more. And I think that's a uh, really well planned and very good uh, idea that a lot of tracks should uh, take up on. Yeah, so here in Virginia and really the southeast, you know, the late model stocks, you have, we always make this joke, I don't know the exact number of cars, it may be 80, it may be 120 late model stocks in the region that are active, we competing, we always make the joke that there's these 20 tracks or whatever it is vying for these 80 to 120 cars, and um, if you're halfway decent at math, which I'm barely halfway decent, like that, that does not divide out very well for those 20 tracks. Um, so that that's kind of how we look at that is, you know, um, and, and I think over time you'll see us have more events outside of racing. We're actively working on some of those plans now, but um, that's just kind of how we do it. And we, we try to be, you know, like I said, we consider ourselves a prestigious venue. So we try to make sure that it's not watered down and each event is special for a reason and that we also are guaranteeing ourselves and our fans enough cars to be able to keep that going on and have that competitive racing that people want to come and see. Um, and we're also in rural Virginia. We pull a ton of folks from large markets like um, Raleigh, Durham, you know, Richmond, Lynchburg, things of that nature, Greensboro and, and the Piedmont Triad area. But folks are busy and they have a lot to do. So um, you know, it's a balancing act. Do we race more and have less fans or do we race less and have more fans? You know, it, it probably would honestly wash out. Um, I think the car count would take a hit per each race and the fans as well. It probably washes out to the same amount of tickets sold and cars in the pits. But at the same time, um, it kind of is a better show if you can have 17 to 18 late models on average versus, you know, less than that because you're racing all the time at least that's how it works out in my head i don't know if there's any science to it yeah well let me ask you this um and i i'm pretty sure i know the answer to this uh but you see uh recently nascar converts an asphalt track to dirt they want to get back to their roots so they say but bristol wasn't a dirt racer before or anything South Boston was. Has that ever even come across anybody's mind or an idea that people throw out? Say, hey, let's uh, make this a dirt track once in a while and put on a crazy event with this. Um, I've made that joke because I'm a dirt fan that I'd love to. Yeah. My my maintenance staff just look at me and I can see their letters of resignation in their hands basically when I mention it. Um, I don't know how the locals would feel. You have some core fans that they would take that kind of offensively. Um, but I think it would be cool to do as like a one-off novelty sometime, um, you know, um, but kind of like I said about SRX, if that is something that was ever done. Um, and like I said, I think it would be cool as a one-off or so. It's definitely not something I would, I would recommend every year, but, um, and you know, there are so many cool dirt tracks out there too, that it, it's hard to, it's hard to compete with them. I mean, when you've got like the Eldoras or, um the Knoxville's and things like that obviously those are the mecca of dirt track racing but you know you look at the world of outlaw schedules and they go to so many cool places like Volusia and here in Virginia you've even got a really nice venue of Virginia uh, Virginia Motor Speedway that's dirt I mean it's it's tough to compete with the experts on that yeah um kind of want to end on a uh on a thought that I had um a lot of people have talked about it, and Wilkesboro is coming back in the picture uh, with uh, the Cup Series returning there, and there's talks about possibly Rockingham eventually coming back to NASCAR. Do you think uh, South Boston will come back to hosting some sort of major NASCAR series again? You know, I other than just spe speculating, which I'm careful not to do, um, do I see it being a possibility down the road? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you've seen that 
especially the truck series has started to balance that out a little better um, by going to, you know, they're, I think they're at Milwaukee this year, which is a return there. They were at Lucas Oil last year. They, they may be at Lucas Oil again. Right. Uh, sh- shame on me for not knowing. But, um, you know, obviously there are requirements that those series have now for safety and such um, at the level they're competing. And, and then those are great that um, South Boston or other short tracks would have to would have to own up to and, and start doing um, safer barrier being a great example. And I think you see Stafford doing that just um, uh, with adding a ton of safer barrier there, which I think is great. Um, I'm a huge fan of that. So there, there are things that would have to take place in order for that to happen. But um, do I see it being a possibility down the road? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's also you have to also be very careful with it. It's a balancing act. Um, again, you can't water it down right. too much, in my opinion. You, you have to have that delicate balance. Well, uh, we're all rooting for uh, that to uh, to happen because this has again such a historic racetrack, fun racetrack to uh, watch his drivers uh, compete at, and it's really cool. Now it's finally on streaming and it's out there in the world; everybody's able to see it. So, uh, Chase, listen, I appreciate you uh, joining me today. Everybody, go check out South Boston. Check them out on their website, uh, South uh, South Boston Speedway dot com, South Boston dot com. What is South the uh, Speedway dot com? Okay, go check them out. Check out their schedule. If you're in the area, want to go check out an awesome historic racetrack, uh, they'll definitely put on a great show for you. Go check them out on that July 4th weekend. Uh, I might have to put that in my calendar to try to make it up for uh, for that. That'd be uh, pretty awesome to see myself. Absolutely. It's a show like no other. Uh, well, Chase, I appreciate it. Everybody, uh, if you enjoyed this, like and subscribe on the YouTube channel and follow anywhere, all social media platforms and all uh, podcasting networks. Uh, General Manager South Boston Speedway, uh, Chase Bershears. Thank you, Chase. Thanks, man. Have a good one.